All right, now we're doing problems about vectors. First problem, define the x-axis to, to be to the east and the y-axis to be north. And before you say, duh, it's not necessarily obvious that the x-axis is east and the y-axis is north. There is no universal, this is the way the x-axis must be. So if you're going to use x, y, and z directions, and you're on the earth or something like that, you have to specify that the x-axis is neat to the east. One of the things you will also see us doing sometimes is have x-axis to the right and z, or sorry, the y-axis up off of the ground. Here the z-axis is up off of the ground. Which one is more intuitive? Eh, it's not obvious and it really depends on which problem you're doing, which one is sort of easier to think about. So the lesson is you always have to specify which way is x, which way is y if you're going to start writing down vector components. So I have now specified this. We have two cars. We have car A, so this is supposed to look like a little car here, and it's driving north, so I'll call this vector VA, and it's driving north with speed, and if I write it without the little vector sign, that's the speed, 25 meters per second. Then there's car B, which is driving due northwest, so that's north, that's east, so northwest is that way. So here's car B, and when we say due northwest, what that means is that the velocity of B makes a 45 degree angle with respect to north. That's what due northwest is. And 45 degree angles are convenient because it means that this leg and that leg, if you imagine the little right triangle here, the two legs will have the same length as each other. And so that'll make breaking this into components easier. If this wasn't 45 degrees, when we break into components, we'd have to use sines and cosines. Not a big deal. We'll be doing that a lot this semester, but we won't have to right here. I mean, we'll implicitly do it, but it's pretty easy. First question, what is the velocity of each car? Well, it turns out if I just say VA is 25 meters per second north, I'm done. I've given you a magnitude and a direction. That's enough to specify a vector. But I'm actually going to do this in a slightly different way. I'm going to write out the components because for most calculations we do with things, it's nice to have the vector written in the form of components. Either fully specifies the vector. You can go from one to the other. So VA in this case is 0, comma 25 meters per second, comma 0. That's velocity A. Velocity B is harder because we, I mean here, we knew it was all in the Y direction. It has some X, it's going to be in the negative X direction, and some Y, and we know that the speed of B is 15 meters per second, but we don't know what either the X or the Y components are. So what I'm going to do is just start with, we know that VBX, the speed, is going to have to equal the square root, sorry, not VBX, just VB, the speed, is the square root of the X component of VB, which I'm going to call VBX squared, plus the Y component of B squared, plus the Z component of B squared. Now we know that VBZ is equal to zero. The car is driving on flat ground and it's going northwest, it's not going up or down. So VBZ is zero given this axis definition. We also know because this is a 45 degree angle, we know that VBX has to be negative and it also has to be the negative of VBY because if these didn't have the same absolute value that wouldn't be a 45 degree angle. So we can substitute these th things into here. We have VB, I'm going to substitute minus VBY for VBX, so it's VBY squared minus VBY squared right? plus VBY squared plus zero, which I won't even write out because adding zero doesn't do much. Now this, remember that a negative number squared is the same as the positive number squared, so that's VBY squared plus VBY squared. And of course that is just the square root of 2 times VBY squared. And because VBY squared under the square root, and we know that VBY is positive, so I can just pull that out of the square root, but I have to leave the square root of 2 there. Or VBY, which we know is positive just because of the way it's drawn, in this case, has to be VB divided by the square root of 2. I've divided both sides by the square root of 2. Notice I haven't put any numbers in yet. I had to do a little bit of algebra here. You always want to do algebra just with the variables. Do not plug in numbers. If they're really simple numbers like one is twice another, you can put that two in. That's fine. But here, if I had put in the 15 meters per second, it would have made this whole thing a little messier from the beginning. Don't put the numbers in until the very end. Well, now I'm at the very end, so I put in 15 meters per second. I divide by the square root of 2, and I get 15 divided by the square root of 2. 
607 meters per second. Now, of course, I only have two sig figs here, so really I should round this to 11 meters per second, but I want to remember this 10.607 because I might need it for future, in fact, I know I will need it for future calculations. So what I'm going to do is write up here VB is equal to, well, this is VBY, so VBX is minus 11, because we know VBX is the negative of VBY meters per second, comma, 11 meters per second, comma, zero. That is VB, and I'm going to write down that we, the numbers are actually 10.607 meters per second. Just to remind myself, if I use this number again, I want to use the number that has more digits than are significant, otherwise you lose precision on stuff. So that's part A. Part V, part V, part B, there it goes. Part B is what is the relative velocity of the two cars? So what does relative velocity mean? You've probably had the experience where you're sitting at a stoplight, so this is you in your car, and there's a big old Mack truck next to you. And the Mack truck starts to move forward a little bit. And because out of your eye, what you just see is this big truck occupying your whole field of view, you feel like you're drifting backwards. You're not moving backwards relative to the Earth. Relative to the Earth, which is how we usually like to measure our speeds when we're talking about cars, relative to the Earth, the Mack truck is moving forward. But you feel like you're moving backwards. Well, that's because your relative speed, relative to the Mack truck, is in fact backwards. So that's what we mean by relative velocity. What is your relative velocity? Relative speed. Speed doesn't have a direction. Your relative velocity is backwards relative to the truck. So what we're asking for here, and of course I didn't specify well enough, do you want the velocity of B relative to A or the velocity of A relative to B? Let's just do the velocity of B relative to A to pick one to do. I should have written that a little better in the problem. The way you do that, well, if I want the velocity of car B relative to car A, you just subtract the one that it's relative to. So that's not too hard. And I'm just going to go ahead and put this in. I mean, we already have the numbers here. So VB minus VA is, well, here VB, it's minus, let's go ahead and put back in 10.607 meters per second, because this is an intermediate calculation, minus zero. So that was easy. Next, VB minus VA, we have 11 meters per second minus, except I wanted to keep the extra digits, 10.607 meters per second minus 25 meters per second. And then zero minus zero is just zero, so I'll leave that like that. So that's the relative velocity, so I can calculate this out. This first one is easy, minus 10.607. I'm still keeping the extra digits, meters per second, comma, 10.607 minus 25 is going to give us minus 14.393 meters per second, comma, zero. Or if I write it to the right number of significant figures, it's minus 11 meters per second, comma, minus 14 meters per second, comma, zero. That's not a, that should be a second there. So that is the relative velocity of car B relative to car A. And that's the answer to part B. So from the point of view of part car A, Right. From the point of view of car A, the entire Earth is moving south at 25 meters per second. A weird way to think about it, but sure, the ground, I mean, it's like when you look out and you see the trees going back. That's the tree moving relative to you. Car B is moving that way, right? It's got a negative 11 in this direction. Well, no surprise it's moving that way because car B is moving that way, but it's also moving that way because car B, not only is car A faster than car B, it's also got all of its velocity oriented that way. So car B is sort of falling behind car A as time goes on. All right, so that's part B. Part C is, what is the relative speed of the two cars? Well, speed is just magnitude of velocity. So and the way we can write that is speed is magnitude of velocity. I didn't actually name this relative velocity vector, but you can just put those around it to indicate the magnitude of it. That's going to be the square root of 10.607. I'm not going to write the units on it, I'll explain why in a moment. Plus 14.393, and notice again I'm keeping extra digits for intermediate numbers, plus zero squared, that's easy, meters per second. Notice what I did is there were a meter square, meters per second in here, and it was squared, and another one here, and another one here, and I just sort of factored all the meters per second out. And because it was squared and I took it out of the square, it just becomes a meters per second out there. That's legitimate. 
So let's go ahead and calculate this. So if I do 10 point, fail, 10.607 squared, 14.393 squared, and I add them, and I take a square root, I get 17.88 meters per second, or to the right number of significant figures, 18 meters per second. That's the relative speed. So notice, it's not 25 minus 15, which would have been 10 meters per second. It's actually more than that because these two things are not moving in the same direction. So their relative speed is 18 meters per second. So that's the first problem. All right, second problem. What angle does the displacement vector V equals 3.0, 1.5, minus 1.5 meters make with respect to the y-axis. Now, a couple things here. First of all, I hear you saying, wait, V is velocity and R is displacement. You did it wrong. And the answer is no. <clears throat> the answer is, I did it in maybe an ill-advised way, but it's not wrong. Yes, it would be much wiser to not use V for a displacement because V is usually used for velocity, and this will only lead to confusion. But it's important to understand that these algebraic variables, including vector variables, are just names we give to things. And so I have chosen to use the name V for this displacement here, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong about that. Ill-advised, yes, wrong, no. And so it's worth getting used to that. I chose VY because it's a vector, and vector starts with a V. Whatever, you don't need a reason. I just gave it that name. And you have to get used to keeping track of what names are what, that names can be anything. Right? So x, x doesn't have to be the thing you're finding when you're doing algebra necessarily. It's traditional, but it doesn't have to be. Next, what is the angle it makes with respect to the y-axis? Well, maybe a hard question. So I'm going to try and draw this here in 3D. So that's the x-axis, that's the y-axis, that's the z-axis. And if I wanted to draw v, notice it goes out 3 in x, 1.5 in y, and then minus 1.5 in z. So I might draw it something like this, right? And so I try and draw it like this, so that I draw this little dotted thing here to indicate that it's actually pointing back into the board a little bit. So that's v, and then the angle I'm after is this angle. How do I find that angle, which I have just chosen to name theta? Well, remember, we have these little unit vectors so y hat is a little vector like that, and the angle between v and the y-axis is the same as the angle between v and y hat, because y hat points along the y-axis. And I can use the dot product for this, because remember that v dot product y is equal the magnitude of v times the magnitude of y hat times cosine of the angle between v and y hat, which is what I've drawn there. Well, that's nice. So now I can actually just calculate this. V dot Y is pretty easy. Remember, the way you do the dot product is you multiply the first components, the second components, and the third components, and you add the three. Well, Y hat is just 0, 1, 0. So we're going to add 0 plus 1.5 plus minus 1.5. V hat dot Y hat is just 1.5 meters. Is equal to, well, the magnitude of Y hat is 1, cosine theta, but we still have to figure out the magnitude of V hat. There's another thing I've done that I sort of uh, hate myself for, so years in purgatory now, is that I started plugging in numbers before I finished the algebra. So I'm a terrible, terrible person. Really, what I should have done was written cosine theta is equal to v vector dot y hat divided by the magnitude of v and the magnitude of y hat. And that's good. Well, here's v dot y. I know y hat is 1. I still have to figure out the magnitude of v. So let's figure that out. That's going to be the square root of 3 squared plus 1.5 squared plus another 1.5 squared meters. That's the magnitude of V. So let's do that. 3 squared is 9. 1.5 squared is 2.25. So I add two of those plus a 9. I get 13.5. I take a square root. I get the magnitude of V is 3.674 meters. So now I can plug in. Now you may say, wait a minute, shouldn't you finish the algebra and write arc cosine? Well, maybe. 
but I'm just going to leave it as cosine theta for now. V dot Y hat is 1.5 meters. I need to divide it by 3.674 meters. Notice the units cancel. That's good because cosines and sines, trig functions, are unitless things. So they had better cancel. And in this case, it did. So if I take 1.5 and I divide it by that, I get it's 0.408. So cosine theta is 0.408. So that out remains to find what is theta. Well, you need to take the arc cos, which is the opposite of cos, sometimes also written cosine to the negative 1. I don't like to do it that way because to me that looks like 1 over cosine. It's confusing with the powers. So the arc cosine of 0 0.408, I have a button for that here, is 1.15, and that's radians. So remember, radians, if you haven't run into them before, a radian is another unit of angle, and it's defined such that there are 360 degrees in 2 pi radians. What's more, radian is sort of a non-unit, so I don't even write radians on it. But I could. So yeah, I could write radians here and radians here and then cancel them. So I can do this conversion by taking this number, 1.15, multiplying it by 360, dividing it by 2, and dividing it by pi. Where is my pi button? There it is. I'm getting to the point where I'm going to have to wear glasses to use my calculator. It's pretty sad. And I get that it's 66 degrees. They is 66 degrees, which looking at this assuming I drew this reasonably, actually looks pretty plausible. So that is the angle between these two things. So just to remind yourself what I did, I started making sure I knew what V was. I found a vector that was parallel to the y-axis, and I used this general thing, because the dot product is easy to calculate from components. I used that, I calculated the magnitudes, and from that I was able to back out the angle, and I just had my calculator configured to do things in radians. You can configure your calculator for degrees or radians, know which you have, so that the answers you get make sense. So I got 1.15 radians, I converted that to degrees, I get 66 degrees. That's the second problem. The third problem is very much like the second problem, except now I have two different vectors, and I want to find the angle between them instead of with one of the axes. So I'm going to write my vectors up. U vector is a displacement, is defined as minus 2.3 comma 1.7, because that point is important, minus 0.5 meters. And V is a velocity now. V vector is 3.0 comma 1.5 comma minus 1.5, that should look familiar, meters per second. And the question is, what is the angle between them? Now you say, wait a minute, they don't have the same units, so how can I even compare the angle between them? Well, you can, just fine. Um, just think about it. Suppose that here is the origin. From here to here is the displacement of my head from the origin, so that's in that direction. Now suppose I'm going like that, because I'm beating my head against the wall or face palming at high speed because sometimes you have to face palm at high speed. It's that bad. Well, the displacement is that way and my head's velocity is that way and the angle between them is 90 degrees. So it's perfectly reasonable to think about an angle between a displacement and a velocity. So here they are. Let's do this. Well, same thing as last time. We know that u dot v is going to equal the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times cosine of the angle between them. Very exciting. So let's just go ahead and do it. So once again, we're going to calculate cosine theta has to equal u dot v over the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v. And so let's just calculate these three things. So u dot v is equal to uh, minus 2.3 times 3 is going to equal minus, so it's 3, 6, 9, yeah, minus 6.9 meters squared per second, right? So there's 2.3 on the meters, 3.0 meters per second, so you have meters times meters per second, so you get that. Plus 1.5 times 1.7, that has now passed my ability to just do it in my head, so I'll do that, 1.5, 1.7 times 2.55 plus, and notice they're both plus, so it's plus 2.55 meters squared per second. 
Now we have minus times minus. 1.5 times 0.5 is just going to be 0.75. Half of 15 is 7.5, right? So plus 0.75 meters squared per second. So now I just need to add these three numbers. So 2.55 plus 0.75. Stay on, please, calculator. 0.75 plus minus 6.9 minus is minus 3.6 meters squared per second. Okay, and it turns out that it's exactly it's 3.60, right? These two fives added to zero. We have two significant figures in this number. Um, but I didn't have to round it, so that's good. Next, we want to get the magnitude of u. Well, all right, so I know there's going to be a meter squared under the square root. I'll pull that out and just have the meters at the end. It's going to be 2.3 squared, because the negative squared goes away, plus 1.7 squared plus 0.5 squared meters. So the magnitude of u, I will just quickly calculate that on the calculator, and this is this is very hazardous. It's very easy to push buttons wrong and do it wrong. So it's worth doing it more than once and checking to make sure you did it right. So 2.3 squared plus 1.7 squared plus 0.5 squared is that. I take a square root. I get 2.903 meters is the magnitude of u. And that is bigger than any one of these, so at least that's plausible. And the magnitude of V, I think we did this once before. Who knows? I can't remember that far back. 3 squared is 9. 1.5 squared is 2.25. And I have another one. I just happen to remember that 15 squared, let me see if I really did that right. 1.5 squared, yes, is 2.25 meters per second. So if I add those three together, 2 times 9 plus square root, I get, yes, I did do this before, 3.674 meters per second. And so now that I have these three numbers, I can plug them in here. So I know that cosine theta is going to equal u dot v is minus 3.6 meters squared per second divided by 2.903 meters times 3.674 meters per second. All right, there they all are. Um, meters squared, I have meters times meters. Yes, those cancel. I have one over seconds on the top. I have one over seconds on the bottom. All the units go away as hoped. And now I can do this division. Uh, so if I do it, I get cosine theta is minus 0.337. For six to an absurd number of digits. It's okay for cosine to be negative. What does that mean? Well, cosine, you may remember, I don't know if you've ever talked in a class about the unit circle, but if you draw the x and the y plane like this, um, if I have that, that has a negative x and a positive y, this angle, if I call that angle theta, the cosine of the angle is x over that distance, call it r, say, x over r. The sine of the angle is y over r, so an angle bigger than 90 degrees has a negative cosine. So that's what's going on here. We know this is going to be bigger than 90 degrees. So let's just go ahead, and, and I'm going to do it in radians again. I'm going to go ahead and take the arc cosine of this, and so I get equals 1915 Radians, and I can convert that to degrees by saying there are 360 degrees and not one radian and two pi radians. So two pi radians is a circle, 360 degrees is a circle, so I multiply this by 360. I divide by two and I divide by pi, which takes a whole bunch of buttons to get pi on this calculator, but whatever. And I get 110 to three digits, because it's 109.7, so I get 110 um, so this was theta this year, 110 degrees for theta, which is bigger than 90 degrees as predicted. So that's how you do the third problem. Go back and rewatch it if you got lost. Or come ask me. Next problem. The third problem is, by using vector components, explicitly show that distribution works for dot products, i.e. that a dot 
B plus C is equal to A dot B plus A dot C. Now, there's a few things here. Show, how do I show? Proofs, oh no, math, scary. The other thing you might be thinking though is, why are you even at? Of course it works, that's what distribution is, duh. And what I want to point out is that, even though it seems like it should be obvious, it's actually not obvious that this works. So yes, for numbers, if I take numbers and I'll use u, v, and w, u times v plus w, if these are just scalars, is equal to u, v plus u, w. That's just how you distribute the distributive property. It's something that you can do with basic algebraic variables. Okay, so the question is, does the same thing work with vectors? It's a little deceptive here because a lot of the stuff we do with vectors, we do pretty much the same thing. We add vectors. We add regular algebraic variables. And you get used to thinking, oh, it's just regular algebra like I already know. But there are some things that work with regular algebra that do not work with vectors. Maybe the most obvious being, I can divide. I could divide both sides by u here. And that's a meaningful thing to do. Dividing by a vector isn't even a defined operation. I can't divide by a vector. That's just not a thing. Dividing by a vector is not a thing, right? So given that already, but here's the other thing. You know, the, the commutative principle says that u times v is equal to v times u. That works for multiplication. It turns out that works for dot products. For vectors later, we will see another kind of multiplication called the cross product that we will use a little later in this course where they don't commute, where you multiply in the opposite order, you don't get the same answer. So what this means is, is that all the stuff that you thought you could just do, maybe you can't with vectors, and we have to be a little careful to find out what you can do with vectors. So it turns out you can do this. This is fine. This works. And to show it, what I'm going to do is write this whole thing out in terms of components. So this is going to be fairly verbose. So I say ax, ay, az, so that is a vector, dotted with, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write it as column vectors because it'll use the board space more efficiently. So A, X, A, Y, A, Z, dotted with B, X, B, Y, B, C, plus C, X, C, Y, C, Z. Now, the other thing I'm going to do is put a question mark over the equal sign, because we don't yet know if this is true. We're checking to see if it's true. So I'm going to have a question mark over the equal sign. That also means that I can't, uh, well, I don't want to say that. Fine. Is that the same as A, X, a, Y, A, Z, dotted with B, X, B, Y, B, Z, plus A, X, A, Y, A, Z, dotted with C, X, C, Y, C, Z. Well, let's multiply this out. I'll do this first. So we have an A, X, A, Y, A, Z, dotted with Let's do this vector sum, bx plus cx, by plus cy, bz plus cz, All right, dot those two vectors. Is that the same as, and I'm going to do out this dot product. So this first dot product is axbx plus ayby plus azbz, right, that's the dot product of these two. To do a dot product, you multiply the first one by the first one, plus the second one times the second one, plus the third one times the third one, and you add them up. Plus AXCX plus AYCY plus AZCZ. Okay, and I'm actually done with the right side. Now I have to do this side. AX times BX plus CX, right? I multiply the first ones. I add times the second one, AY times by plus cy, and now the third component plus az times bz plus cz is equal to, well, that's just that same thing. And now I'm going to distribute all these out. Why? Because I see I have a whole bunch of individual separate sums here. So I'm going to distribute these out so I have it in the same form and I can compare terms and see if it works. So I have axbx plus axcx plus ayby plus A, Y, C, Y, plus A, Z, B, Z, my question marks there, plus A, Z, C, Z. Is that the same as, well, just looking at it, A, X, B, X, plus A, Y, B, Y, they're not in the same order. But remember, this now, there's no vector in here anymore. These are all just numbers. No, they're not, you say, they're variables. Well, they're variables that would be, rep that represent things that are just numbers. 
So all the standard rules of algebra apply, including the commutative principle. So what I'm going to do is underline things as I copy them down here. I'm going to start with ax bx plus ax cx. So I've written those two terms plus ay by. All right, now this term plus ay cy. So all I'm doing is taking advantage of the commutative property to write these in different orders. Plus az bz plus az cz. And now if you look at the two sides, you can see I have ax bx plus ax cx plus ay by plus ay cy plus az bz plus az cz on both sides. So yes, it does work. So this shows that the distributive principle, now I can erase this question mark because we know it works, does work for vectors. We proved this by writing it out in terms of the components. Once we had done all the dot products, we were down to old fashioned algebra just using regular numbers. And so we don't have to worry about, oh, is there some scary vector thing that comes in here? We're dealing with just regular algebraic variables and we see these two things are the same as each other. It works. That was problem four, one left. Last problem. A ball is moving with constant velocity v, I'm going to write it up for reference, v is equal to minus 25.0, a terrible equal sign. You probably couldn't even see it because my head might be, is my head in the way? <laughs> minus 25.0, minus 2.0, comma 1.0 meters per second. And it starts at a distance. 68 meters away from the origin in the plus x direction. What that says is that its initial displacement, which I will call r sub zero, is equal to 68 meters away in the plus x direction from the origin, 68 meters comma zero comma zero, right? That is in the plus x direction, 68 meters away from the origin. When and where does this ball cross the yz plane? So to draw what this looks like, I'm going to draw x, you know, I should do this more carefully here so that, wow, disaster. Draw my axes again. I'll draw the x-axis first, then the y-axis, and then I'm going to draw my z-axis in two things like that. Isn't that better? Here is x, uh, here is y, and then z sticks out of the board here. X, y, z. Very good. It starts here, way the heck far away at 68 meters, and it's moving at minus 25, so left on x, left and y, and then it's also coming out of the board a little bit. So it's moving like this, right? Much, much bigger component in x. Has a little component out, it's also going down, so the projection onto the xz plane looks something like this. And so if you just take this guy's motion, so he starts here, and he's going this way, do, 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 boom, somewhere he's going to cross the YZ plane. When and where does that happen? Oh, wow, how straight was that knot? Pretend I drew a straight line there for that dotted line. Well, okay, what does it mean to cross the YZ plane? On the YZ plane, well, the YZ plane is defined by all points that have X is equal to zero, right? That's what that is. The yz plane is this plane here, and that's where x is zero. Everywhere x is zero is the yz plane. Good, so what I need to do is figure out when is x zero. And the way I can figure that out is, you know, start with r is equal to r zero plus vt. So r zero is the time that has to be a vector pull out just the x component of this, so x, I also sometimes call this r sub x, but I'm just going to call it x here. x is equal to x0 plus vxt, t, when. I'm answering the when question first. So let's find t. Well, I subtract x0 from both sides, and I divide both sides by vx, so x minus x0 over vx is equal to t. Now I can plug in numbers. Well x, I want to know when is x zero? x equals zero is the time I am looking for, minus the original x, so x zero is 68 meters, divided by v sub x, v sub x is minus 25.0 meters per second. So you can see that I've got meters over meters, seconds in the denominator is the same, one over seconds in the denominator rather, is the same as just seconds in the numerator. I have a negative number divided by a negative number, so I'll get a positive number. 
So if I actually do this, 68 divided by 25, I get 2.72 seconds. So that says that 2.72 seconds from now is when the ball will cross the YZ plane. So, to the right number of significant figures, that would just be 2.7 seconds. And I also wrote it wrong there. Which did I mean? I meant 2.72. 2.72 seconds. Okay, good. Now that I know the time, I can use, what I'm going to do is erase this, because I've used it, and that, but I'm going to use this again. And now I'm just going to use the Y and Z components. I can say, well, um, that says that Y at any time is equal to the initial Y plus VYT, and Z is equal to the initial Z plus VZT, I can just use both of those to figure out what is the Y and Z at any later time. I'm going to put in the time when it's on the YZ plane, right? So the time when the ball is here, that is the time on the YZ plane. I just want to figure out what is the Y and what is the Z at that time. So let's do that. Y zero is zero. VY is minus 2.0 meters per second. And I multiply that by the time. 2.72 seconds. Sure enough, I'll get a meters. And then Z is also Z0 is 0 plus 1.0 meters per second. This multiplication, I bet you can do in your head. Because if you can't multiply by 1 in your head, you have problems. No offense, but it's true. Okay, so when all is said and done, um, 2 times 2.72, 2.72 times. It's 5.44. So we know it's going to cross the YZ plane at x is equal to 0. That's what defines the YZ plane. Y is equal to minus 5.4 meters. And that is, in fact, the right way. 0, let's pretend that's perfect, but we had um, two significant figures in this. So 5.4, that's how it works out. Um, and then plus 1.0. So it's actually crossing it in the plus 2.7 meters. All right, so that is what this point is right there. That is where it crosses the YZ plane. Now, suppose, and you will see this on the homework, what if I asked, when do, I don't know if this exact problem is on the homework, but something like this on the homework. When does it cross the Y axis? Well, the Y axis is defined by both X and Z being zero. I could do that by saying, okay, when is x zero? Is z zero at the same time? I would have discovered no. So the answer is it never actually crosses the yz axis. It goes off in front of the yz, the y axis like this, rather. It never crosses the y axis. It misses the y axis. You figure that out by asking the time, okay, I have two things I have to satisfy to be on the y axis, x equals zero and z equals zero. Figure out the time for one, calculate what the other is at that time, see if it works out. All right, that was the last problem. Those are your vector video problems.